Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for this webinar is blockchain technology for RECs, tracking systems, and other energy market applications. This webinar is being presented by the Clean Energy States Alliance, also known as CESA, as part of the RPS Collaborative. And our host for this webinar is Warren Leon. Warren is the Executive Director of CESA. And we have with us two excellent guest speakers. Before I pass it over to them, though, I'd like to go over a few quick housekeeping notes. So you have a couple of options to join the audio portion of the webinar. You can connect using your mic and speakers, which is the default option, or you can connect using your telephone. And there's some dial-in information for that. If you'd like to minimize the webinar console so that you can view the presentation full screen, you can click on the little red or orange arrow that you see circled here, and that arrow also works to expand the webinar console. A very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions and your comments as you think of them throughout the webinar by typing them into the questions box on the webinar console and hitting send. We will get to as many questions as we can, but we, uh, we do expect to have a lot of questions. There are a lot of people who registered for this webinar, so we probably will have more questions than we can answer. So to make sure that we get to your question, type it in when you think of it. Don't wait until the very end. And a final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will post the recording and a PDF of the slides on our website within probably about 24 to 48 hours, likely this afternoon. And then it'll be on our website at cisa.org backslash webinars. We'll also send you an email, everyone who registered, uh, you'll get an email with a link to those webinar materials. But if you're looking for them after the fact, you can find them at our web address here, and that's also a good place to find info about upcoming webinars. So with the housekeeping out of the way, I'd like to hand it over to our host for this webinar, Warren Leon. Hey, thank you very much, Samantha. Uh, this webinar is being hosted by the Clean Energy States Alliance. We're a national nonprofit organization, a coalition of public agencies across the country, mostly state agencies, and you could see their logos here on the screen. These agencies work together to um, exchange information about clean energy and advance clean energy. If we could move to the next slide. And in particular, the webinar is part of the activities of the RPS Collaborative, which is an effort funded by the Energy Foundation and the U.S. Department of Energy to facilitate information exchange among state RPS administrators, federal agency representatives, and other stakeholders. We try to advance dialogue and learning about RPS programs. We identify the challenges, possible solutions, best practices. We have a monthly newsletter which talks about what's going on around the country in the wonderful world of RPS, and we do webinars like this one today. You can go to our website, as you could see here, to get on the mailing list. And if we can go to the next slide. Today, you know, we are talking about blockchain technology and its applications for the energy arena and energy markets. We have two excellent speakers with us today. Um, I'm going to introduce the first one, um, Alex Anich, and I will introduce Ben Gerber later before he speaks. Alex is gonna speak first. And Alex is Manager of Renewable Market Intelligence for NRG Energy Incorporated. In that role, he oversees the company's renewable energy certificate portfolio. He leads NRG's exploration of the application of blockchain technology to the REC and environmental attribute markets. Before he joined NRG, Alex headed up the research and advisory service of Carbone, which is a New York City-based brokerage, project finance, and research firm, which focuses on environmental markets. With that as an introduction, let me turn it over to Alex.
And Alex, you should make sure you're not muted. Thank you, Warren. I'm just going to test that I've got uh, control of the uh, screen. And there we go. Um, thanks for the introduction, Warren. Um, I'm going to uh, lead us through uh, a few key points uh, today uh, in, in this webinar. Uh, firstly, I'm going to introduce some basic concepts. Then I'm going to run through the technology and put a little bit of history and perspective on it. Um, really, it's just a basic introduction um, to, uh, the, the, to the blockchain space, really just to, to get some key concepts into everybody's head. Um, to be able to then frame up those concepts as we're looking at the application of the, of the blockchain technology uh, to REC markets. Um, the key thing is that uh, where previously we had a centralized clearinghouse um, for, uh, for managing uh, the transactions between two counterparties, uh, what the blockchain does through its distributed ledger uh, technology process is, is enable peers to be able to transact uh, with each other without needing a, a trusted central party. And that's really key for the energy space um, because a lot of the time, if you're talking about PPAs or other, other contracts or, or any contract in the world, it's really about two counterparties transacting with each other, trying to develop a, 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 a trust and a risk framework to ensure that uh, when I send uh, my rec uh, one way, that I'm going to get dollars or some other uh, you know, form of payment coming back the other way. And distributed tech te uh, ledger technology through Bitcoin as, it, as its, its first real application to, to, to currencies has proven that this is, that this is possible. Um, so basic concepts. Um, with the digital age, we, we now have the ability to, to replicate uh, content um, and ensuring that there is uh, uh, provenance of that content is is big, been one of the biggest challenges. Uh, we saw, you know, initially with Napster and 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 music uh, piracy or music copying and sharing, we had certain issues uh, that arose, um, and we have the same issues that come um, uh, with the the renewable energy certificate space as well. Um, what the what the uh, DLT technology and and I like to describe this uh, now as distributed ledger technology. Um, blockchain is what was technically the first iteration of this uh, technology, um, but you know, as the technology has evolved and advanced, we've seen new uh, new new technologies come out. Um, whether they be uh, things like Hashgraph um, or or any other sort of technology that that effectively fulfills the the chain block concept, uh, we like to refer to these all as distributed ledger technology. Um, so. One thing uh, that's key to distributed techno ledger technology is that we have uh, the prevent prevention of copying through encryption, um, and, and that also maintains anonymity of that data. Um, but also, the, the main concept is that um, we have one uh, agreed upon uh, data set, um, and and through the through the consensus mechanism that agrees on that data set, we only have one system of record, and that system of record is something that that one system of record is something that's distinct from the old processes of having uh, multiple databases storing uh, storing different functions uh, or, or different versions of, of that that uh, one commodity or one technology that we that we had digitized or one uh, element that we had digitized. Um, so in a in the current state of the world, uh, particularly with Bitcoin, um, we have what we call uh, uh, basically, uh, an open public blockchain um, that everybody can everybody can see and agree on the state of. Um, what happens in this blockchain is that uh, that there is a, a transfer and not a copying of it. So even though there are replicated uh, versions of it on this distributed ledger, and each uh, different node may hold a copy of it, uh, what's really key to it is is that once everyone agrees to that to that chain and, and uh, to that block or um, and, it's, and it's created, there is no way to, 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 to move it around or to change it. The only thing that can happen is that there's a transfer of it. Um, everybody uh, puts trust in the system um, that, that, that that one uh, distributed ledger is the, is the provenance of record and everybody refers to that. Um, one of the key concepts that comes out of the, the nature of, uh, of this uh, blockchain or, just, or, or, or blocks in a chain of some, in some form in this distributed ledger technology um, 
is that we have a chain of custody. We have provenance. We know where the, where the commodity has come from and where it's ended up. And that's really essential, something that's uh, essential to uh, renewable energy certificates. We need to know the source of that certificate, that it's come from a renewable facility, that the facility has been verified and that it, as it goes through the chain of, ha of hands that, it's, uh, that, 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 that we have, uh, we can ensure that nothing is, that there's no double counting, um, that there's no double claims on it, and that we have the provenance of that, of that chain of custody. Um, I won't spend too much time speaking about the details of the, of the technology. Um, just, uh, what's just key to understand is that we have, um, we have this, uh, this uh, algorithmic function. So there's a there's a you know a mathematical function that uh, behind this is encryption. Um, and what what happens is is that we have these blocks that 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 get put together in a row. Um, and what they do is they create this chain um, that enables us to to not only understand where, as I was explaining before, where the the commodity has come from, where the the records come from, but understand what uh, counterparties uh, that the the transaction is uh, or the commodity. Uh, has been passed through as it gets, before it's come to to uh, the the current state of where it is of, of ownership. And here's uh, two two graphical examples of, uh, of 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 the of the distributed ledger technology. Um, one on the right is basically the, the blockchain concept, uh, and on the left uh, is the, is what we call the hash graph concept. And hash graph is, or, or uh, directed acyclic graphs. It's just another version of um, of the of the of some sort of block in a in a chain, and uh, and here we can see basically how uh, each one is laid out and how it links to the previous block. Um, so if we look at a little bit of history and perspective, um, we had the original uh, closed centralized mainframe network um, that that kind of uh, that established um, the the information technology age. Um, you know, we've moved uh, to today where we now have uh, data up in the cloud, but it's still heavily centralized. Um, you know, we've seen that with issues with social, uh, with social media, you know, centralized data in Facebook, uh, in, in Google, and in all these different organizations that manage and control it. And then what we see in the future is this move away from centralization to some sort of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, structure, uh, provided that that is the most, uh, you know, efficient and applicable application. One of the key uh, components that uh, that distributed ledger technology brings is the is the concept of smart contracts. I know this smart contract is not something that's brand new that that just got created with distributed ledger technology in in its current state. It's something that existed before. Um, but what's really useful and what's really key um, is that the ability to store uh, to, to store a, a contractual relationship. In a in a self-executable or a, you know a, basically a fully automated contract. So uh, to to say that hey um, you know if these uh, amount of recs uh, come into the account uh, into my account and I have an agreement with uh, Ben who's going to be the other presenter uh, to 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 transfer or or to sell those to, to to Ben at a certain price. As soon as those become available, this contract will will will, will execute itself. We'll have the the recs transferred to the counterparty. And uh, the dollars come the other way, and and that concept of of uh, of automation and the transfer of the rec um, and the dollars coming another way is really key to to uh, is one is really the key component of um, of the of distributed ledger technology, uh, particularly um, as as I want to explain it. Uh, in the efficiency of the market, so I like to describe. Uh, I really want to when when I describe uh, rec, I like to describe the market. Current key centralized database for, for managing RECs, but you know the, the extra components of it that uh, that are uh, the the ability to to transfer that REC to a counterparty in the tracking system. What we have to do to ensure that we get paid by the other counterparty. How we manage the risk and how we manage uh, the data. And so what I'm going to do uh, for my presentation is explain the nature of uh, of the renewable energy certificate marketplace and the data that's that's there and how. Uh, and, and, and and explain how the blockchain can bring uh, about uh, improved efficiency or potentially bring about we're, we're still exploring its its application to potentially bring about the improved efficiency of the of the market as a whole um, 
One of the key things uh, that, I, that I'd, I'd really like to address when we're talking about uh, distributed tech, ledger technology uh, for the market is, um, <coughs> is, are you asking the right questions when you're trying to pr uh, apply blockchain technology to a, to a market? And that means, are you asking the right questions? Uh, Bitcoin, as it was created, is not the only blockchain application. Uh, and it, it, it has certain functionality that, that was built to, to achieve its goals. Um, and what, uh, what can be taken out of that functionality uh, is, is certain elements of it that, you know, still maintain it as a distributed ledger technology or a blockchain technology, but can be, can be adjusted and, 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 uh, and focused on what solution you're trying to find. So what are you trying to solve for? Do you want to solve for, for having a fast, a, a speedy environment? Do you want speed of transactions? Um, do you want to handle a large amount of volume transactions, you know, fast? Okay, people would say, oh, well, if you apply Bitcoin in its current format, you're not going to be able to do that because it's, you know, it's not, it's not fast. Um, so it doesn't handle high volumes that, that we need for the energy space. Okay, so we need to look at how we then can solve for that speed. Uh, we're also looking for efficiency. Um, you know, do we want a low cost, for, you know, like high volume environment? Um, and you know, how how fast do we want the transactions to 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 be able to happen? If you if you think about if you understand the rec space, um, the ability to get paid in the rec space currently takes um, anywhere from thirty to somewhere between ninety and one hundred and twenty days. That is, that's the whole process of of issuing a rec, transferring it to your counterparty. Um, going through the, the invoicing process and then getting paid, you know, it, it takes a long period of time. And so, um, you know, what do we want? What do we look at when we want to solve for that? What's the, what does that cost to be able to achieve that? And how can we improve the efficiency of that market process? Um, additionally, um, you know, what, uh, what security do we need? Is, you know, at, in, in rec markets as they currently stand, there's a lot of confidentiality issues with data. Uh, the markets are, you know, the, the databases are closed so that there is, um, that, that the confidentiality is maintained um, and how do we maintain that, you know, in, a, in an either uh, a potentially completely open uh, distributed ledger technology uh, framework or does there need to be some sort of uh, uh, permissioning, some sort of, uh, you know, password access or limited access to that, uh, to that environment. So those are the three components that, that, uh, that, I, that I, I like to just summarize as, the, as what are we really trying to solve for when we, when we apply distributed ledger technology to rec markets. You know, some of the challenges um, with rec markets is, uh, are, you know, I, I really laid out here. I've, I've, one, I've really spoken just recently to the protracted timing in, this, in the last slide. You know, how long, does it, how long does it take to transact in a rec to actually transfer it, get uh, invoiced, get paid, ensure that everything uh, matches up? Um, additionally, when you look at the, the, the U.S. as a whole, the marketplace is fragmented. You know, that's something that's really driven um, actually by the nature of regulation. And so it's difficult to, to, to say, oh, well, hey, we should just, you know, change all this regulation so that we can have one broad marketplace and everything could, to crack, uh, can transact um, on, on a similar platform. Um, so what we would like to do, what, the, the, what you, sorry, the, the approach that we take when we're thinking about it is to say, okay, well, if we have this fragmented marketplace, how do we design a platform that can, can deal with that fragmentation and have standardization across those platforms, but allow each of those different fragmentations either, you know, into the ISOs, Emirates, such as what, uh, where, where Ben is, uh, is operating, or, you know, PJM GATS or Nepal GIS, allow that still to function, but still have a standardized platform underneath it. Um, then also there's discussion about, you know, the size of the unit. Um, a megawatt hour is, is great for utilities, but it's not really anything that, that your average customer can really deal with. You know, how do you accommodate that? Um, and, you know, what, what does the technology offer for that? Um, and then um, the, the, the real key component that I want to discuss is this disparate market system. So all of the IT platforms that, that need to be maintained by an organization like NRG or anybody else who's transacting in REC to be able to ensure that, the, that the, there is risk management, there is trade cap, the, the trades are captured, um, there is contracting and credit, um, you know, there's invoicing and, and accounting systems. And these are the real key components in understanding the nature of data in the, in the, in the market. And so what makes up a REC market? Here are the key, here are the key systems, and, it, it, and under each of these systems are, are actually IT systems. So we have the tracking system, um, 
you know, that, that's maintained uh, by Emirates, um, you know, that, that has counterparty risk issues. If you, if you transfer a REC to a counterparty in, uh, in, uh, in Emirates, there's no guarantee that you're gonna, gonna get paid. Um, and one of those key, uh, all of the tracking systems, if they have a bulletin board or if they have some sort of, some sort of disclaimer, one of the key disclaimers is that that transfer is not guaranteeing your payment and you, there is no way to, to, to get that back. Um, and then the other, comp other key components are the participants. So we have buyers and sellers, we have the traders and brokers that enable the connection of those buyers and sellers. Uh, we also have the corporate sustainability entities. And then we also have the end, end use customers. That's everywhere from your average retail person who say, who's buying green energy from their, from their local uh, retail electricity provider, all the way up to uh, the uh, utilities that, that buy for RPS purposes. Um, and then, you know, what it, uh, and then the key components is how do we manage these transactions? And again, the data systems infrastructure of, of the market. And I'm going to go on and explain that uh, now. So this is an overview of what I, what I describe as the life cycle of a renewable energy credit in OTC rec markets. Um, and what we see is we have, uh, we have three uh, sort of key, uh, key silos. We have the renewable energy asset, so the, the wind farm or the solar, uh, 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 solar, solar farm that's producing the recs. We have the ISO and the RTO in the middle. That's the, the tracking system that, that actually is the, date, the, the provenance of the, the, the system of records for the rec tracking. And then we have, you know, power, power market is either compliant entity buyers or retailers or other organizations that purchase these, uh, purchase these recs. And in each of these organizations, there's a different functionality. So we have a portfolio management. So when we, when we know that our, that our, uh, our asset is going to generate a certain amount of, of recs, we enter it into a, 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 a tracking system or some sort of system that manages it um, and enables us to, to, to forecast what we're going to generate. And then on the other side, um, we have the, the, the rec obligations of the buyers of these that also do that generation. So everybody's estimating it and everyone has, you know, maybe a, uh, a spreadsheet or something that they use to say, oh, hey, it's going to generate 100,000 rec. Let's enter that into our, into our, our spreadsheet or our own database to manage that data. Um, and then the when, then we go through the trading function. Um, you know we have sales and contracting. So if the if the if we we know that we're going to generate a hundred thousand per year for ten years, and we want to sell to somebody, we know we're going to have to have a contract in place, and that contract itself is going to have uh, effectively a copy of the rec. Um, and that copy of that rec is going to have to match up to the recs that are minted in the tracking system. So now we have a trading platform that has a copy of the rec. We have the rec minting that has a copy of the rec uh, in the tracking system itself. And then on the other side, we have our counterparty that is expecting to receive those recs as well. Um, and then uh, to the, the, the next layer is the actual execution of the transaction. So we have our tracking system application itself. So that's the transfer. Um, and so uh, when we have our, our trading platform and we, we say, okay, we've minted the rec and we're gonna transfer it to our counterparty, we're going to mark that delivery or that transfer into our own tracking system. The, on the other side, uh, the, the counterparty that is receiving it, they're going, to, they're going to mark it in their tracking system. Again, each of these different uh, systems are all take, making copies of the, same, uh, of the same rec as it moves through the, the, the chain of custody. Um, additionally, we have accounting software. So, you know, we're, we're going to transfer this rec and to be able to make the project worthwhile, we need to get paid for it. So we have to, we have to enter it into our accounting system. Our accounting system has to issue an invoice. That invoice gets sent to our counterparty. They enter that into their tracking system, again, into their, sorry, into their accounting software. And again, we, we go through this settlement uh, and, and clearing process to ensure that we get paid. And all the time, we additionally have the next layer, which is these reporting tools. So audit's gonna wanna make sure that everything that's transacting is, is functioning properly. Um, and on the other side, we're, we're making sure that, hey, the dollars that came or the dollars that got sent, there was recs that were matching it and we go through and we go through this reconciliation process. But the key thing to understand here is that each of these different boxes is a copy of the rec in a different IT system as it moves through the, through the, the chain of custody. All of these need to be reconciled against each other and all of these create additional costs to be able to transact. These costs, they're ultimately, you know, they're born and passed through to the rate payer through the RPS or maybe to a retail buyer who chooses to voluntarily purchase uh, a sustainable uh, 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 energy product or electricity product. And so focusing on understanding the cost around this data flow and how we can improve the efficiency of it is, is really key to understanding the benefits that blockchain can bring. Um, 
just a bit about our project. I'm going to wrap up here. I won't spend too much time. You guys can pick up this information because I want to give Ben plenty of time to talk and then us to, to also be able to chat. Um, uh, we have, uh, we're doing a proof of concept. Uh, we've partnered with, um, with NASDAQ. Um, it's not a commercial product. What we're really looking at is, um, you know, how do we solve this problem that I explained in the previous slide of all of the expense of transacting and, and, and managing counterparty and credit risk to be able to ensure that we get paid? Um, what can we do to improve that efficiency? Can we improve the speed of it? Can we ensure that we get paid faster? Um, but, you know, how do we build this from the bottom up? What do we, what do we need to do? Who do we need to get involved? Do we, we need to work with the tracking system operators? Uh, which is how Ben and I had met and have been discussing this over the last uh, almost year now, I, I believe, or coming up to a year. Um, and, you know, what's the right, what's the right framework, understanding what is the right framework or application of blockchain to be able to, um, to achieve the goals that we want to and solve the problems. Really, you know, we've got a, we've got a set of problems that we want to solve. Um, we're looking to solve those with the technology. We're not a technology that's looking for a problem to solve. Um, uh, you know, one of the key things to understand is there's no mining involved in this. Um, you know, it's very, it can be very low energy consumption, so therefore very low cost. Um, we're not looking, we're looking at how to, there's no cryptocurrency involved, so there's no, there's no volatility in price. It's really all about dollars and Rex and, and, and the market value of Rex determining the value of the underlying commodity. Uh, no ICOs particularly. Um, so uh, uh, that's me. I'm, I'm happy to pass over to, uh, to to Warren and to Ben now, and and and, and look forward to hearing from them. Hey, thanks very much, Alex. That did put things into general context. Here, we'll now learn a little bit more about how this can be applied by a tracking system or through tracking systems. But let me introduce Benjamin Gerber, who's executive director of the Midwest. Renewable Energy Tracking System, or MRET. Uh, prior to joining MRET in 2015, he was Director of Energy and Labor Management Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. He represented the Chamber's energy interests at both the legislature and the Public Utilities Commission. He has experience working as an oil and gas attorney in North Dakota, um, and he has experience in Minnesota, including policy and legal work for National Wind LLC, a large-scale community wind developer. Let me turn it over to Ben. Well, thank you so much, Warren. And um, thank you for, for setting this up. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank CISA for really shining a light on um, what I think is obviously where, where I am is an important issue, which is um, rec tracking systems and, and the future of rec tracking systems. It's something that um, not a lot of people pay attention to. And so um, I, I think with um, well, there's been a lot of focus lately because of blockchain on these. And I think ultimately you'll see that I don't think blockchain is the right solution, but I'm just happy that people are paying attention to what we do. Um, uh, a little bit also, you can connect to my background. I come from a a utility regulatory background, so you'll hear a little bit of that in some of my criticisms of blockchain. And um, I'm glad Alice was so nice um, before, but the benefit of going second is I get to point out some of the issues I have with him, <laughs> with his slides. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get in a little bit of that so you get some of the debate style format. So um, just a little bit about MRES. So we are a uh, rec tracking system. We were Previously, until January 2018, um, in 15 states in Manitoba, we still manage the 15 states in Manitoba for the compliance markets, but we also track um, anywhere in North America now um, for the voluntary market. We see that as a really important growing piece of the market. Uh, when I started in 2015, it was around 30% of, of the market share um, uh, uh, voluntary recs. We now, I think, um, in the next two years will become more than 50%. So huge growth. Um, and that was one reason why um, you'll see we went through the analysis of um, should we build our own system and what should we build it for. Uh, we were developed out of a stakeholder process uh, on my board, our utility regulators, renewable energy advocates, uh, as well as utilities. So one thing I want to set up is the, what's happening here. There's a colossal change going 
on um, in not just the utility world, but in our everyday experiences with the idea of the platform economy, the age of the customer. Customers are expecting a lot out of the systems they use, and they're ex ex expecting that the data that they um, use um, it, uh, it, it can be transportable. So something like the GDPR, which is the privacy regulations in, in Europe, but also um, think about your Amazon data, being able to use an Uber for business and have it directly up, uploaded to your receipt system. So we're, we're expecting those seamless transactions. And, and what's really the key to that is, is an API. Um, an API is computer language for portals, uh, electronic portals that can communicate with each other. And so um, one of the things that we really want to stress, and, and I think you can look at some of the issues that Alex says they're trying to solve with blockchain, can really be uh, solved with a, a comprehensive open API. So allowing users, so we view the data in our system as really being owned by the users, that users can access their data in any way they see fit. Um, and I think that's something we really want to emphasize is that um, that you don't need blockchain. You can do that through existing technology um, and offer that API, either the tracking system or as a customer um, of the tracking system so you can communicate um, seamlessly and effortlessly with that. So we have, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We have a massively changing industry, not just the prices, but offsite um, uh, uh, renewable energy uh, contracts. Uh, you have car companies potentially even getting into, as you can see in the bottom right, even getting into the battery space in Europe and the electrification of vehicles, all leading into this really fast-paced industry, which brings about um, uh, you know, a blurring of the lines between what is generation and what is consumption. And there are really three areas. There's demand response the integration of vari uh, variable resources. I know that name changes almost daily. Small scale generation, and then the electrification of, electrification of vehicles are all changing what we do. And I know there's a lot of regular regulators on the call. And what that's really leading to is um, uh, investment in digital infrastructure for utilities. So investment in digital technologies by energy companies has risen um, sharply. So for example, investment in digital electric infrastructure and software has grown by 20% annually since 2014. It's reached um, 47 billion US dollars in 2016. And in 2016 um, was almost 40% higher than investment in gas fired power generation worldwide and almost equal to the total investment in India's electric sector of 55 billion. So clearly the utility industry is changing and within that, you're going to see things like blockchain um, as a regulator and as a consumer, you're going to see things like blockchain or, or as Alex actually correctly calls it distributed ledger technology, I think it's a better term. But what is really the barrier, and here's where my regulatory hat comes on, a regulator hat, not, not a regulator, but my, my understanding of it is we're dealing with um, 30 to 40 year time horizons in the utility industry and software is three to five. Um, costs are way more unpredictable um, in the software world. And um, I, I'm not saying that I um, uh, prescribe to this belief, but there is a belief when you read in media outlets that utilities are not always seen as innovation hubs and that tech moves faster than regulation. And actually at the end of the presentation, we'll get to in uh, the Air Arizona just came out with a docket on transactive energy yesterday. So um, to try to get ahead of these issues. So what MRS and what we did is we um, launched our own um, tracking system after doing um, looking at all different technologies, so the different types of um, uh, the different types of software from the different types of computer languages you'd build this in, um, as well as looking at blockchain. And we realized that um, that that a traditional database structure uh, with a, a front end and a back end that connects through APIs was the preferred method. But one of the things that I want to emphasize is, and you even hear this in the way that Alex talks, and, and this has um, been something as we've talked, we went from blockchain to distributed ledger technology. The software and, and the terms and the type of technologies are changing so rapidly. And when you're making a big investment in building a new software system, the last thing you want to do is make the wrong bet. And I think one thing that's important to think about with software, whether you're operating a rec tracking system or your own internal um, uh, software, is that the day after you launch, almost, your, your software is out of date. And so you really have to constantly innovate. And one of the reasons we built this, again, was for data. 
and so we wanted to um, uh, we wanted to have users have clean access to their to uh, to their data and be able to um, at some point customize and um, and interact with their data through APIs. Um, and I will jump through to so why not blockchain? Um, and I think this is really what what you're here for. What why didn't we? Um, and we met with blockchain developers. Um, as well as traditional database developers. And um, I think, uh, you know, obviously a little bit of a joke, but uh, when you have, uh, as, as Alex mentioned, it's unlikely that a rec tracking system or even something in the renewable attribute space would deal with mining, but mining is a heavily uh, energy intensive process. Blockchain and distributed ledger technology in and of itself is, you're running multiple instances of a database versus one. So while you might have some benefits if your database goes down, it also means a lot of redundancy. I mean, that's something we deal with in the utility world a lot, so it can be viewed as good, but it also can be viewed um, if it's done too much as, as wasteful. Um, and then the access to power because of the redundancy is important. So this is, a, again, an instance um, actually from Australia where there's a consortium that's looking at reopening a, a coal plant. Again, these are tongue in cheek. That's not really, I think, what is happening, but um, it's definitely something to think about. So here's an interesting thing that I, I like to show people, which is the Gartner hype cycle. It hasn't, I haven't been able to find the 2018 version yet, but this is something um, they map out uh, what is going on in terms of technology hype. And you can see in the very, um, on the left side, if you're looking at your computer, a smart dust. So just to give you an example of that, that's sensors that can actually tell um, if, uh, you know, what's in the air, what you're breathing, wearable in some cases wearable technology um, and you can see blockchain where that red arrow um, is coming and it's it's going from the peak of inflated expectations into the trough of disillusionment i think we're seeing a little bit of that uh, right now if you follow energy blockchain um, you were seeing a lot of groups that were really pushing for mvp or minimum viable products usable um, technology to now moving towards icos which I think are fraught with not only some legal issues about securitization, but also it's a way to raise money. Um, and just like anything, some of them are great. Some of them I would be suspicious of when you read um, what they're doing. So I think this is important to keep in mind that this is still a new technology and we're probably five to 10 years out from really understanding what the application will be. Um, and from our perspective, when we were looking at what we do um, for the future, scalability and flexibility was really, really critical. So we see these changes like the rise of distributed generation, um, APIs is, is being necessary to building um, a, a system for the future. So we see the ability for inverters to write directly onto our system um, through APIs as being something that should be able to be done, um, probably already could be done, but should be done um, relatively soon. Um, uh, so that there isn't a need for users to have to go up and constantly update their data. A lot of people are proposing blockchain to do that, um, but you can do that with current technology, so it's not necessary. Um, and the ability to scale with as your users um, go, and that's something important to look at when you see, um, you know, with a, a system where we have, uh, you know, 1,100 generators versus PJM Gas, which has I think is over 175,000 now because of the small solar. Those change the dynamics of your system. And then emerging technologies, when you're looking at building something, whether you're a utility regulator, utility, or, or, or in the um, energy world, is emerging technologies are risky. Uh, they're expensive to develop. The talent is in high demand. Uh, everyone wants to build a blockchain project. Um, the, there was a, one example of the Canada Goose Company that makes the you know, $1,000 jackets, wanted to have a registry that you could log on to see if your jacket was real. So someone like that um, is going to be willing to pay for that as a luxury good. And then maintenance is a lot harder when you have um, uh, a smaller development community. Again, it's going to lead to higher costs. And then you have to balance being leading, cutting, or bleeding edge. And we believe that as um, it was important to our customers that we uh, made calculated, uh, took risk, but took calculated risk. And then um, the security risk analysis. I mean, one of the things that scares me that you hear a lot with blockchain is that it's inherently safer. And I would say nothing is really safe. Um, if you have someone telling you that they can build you a system that's safe, um, I'd run away from them. But there's degrees of safety. And it really, um, blockchain has um, encryption, but traditional databases are encrypted. I'm pretty sure almost every rec tracking system 
has some level of encryption um, uh, in it while well, it's even at rest when it's not being written to. So um, just because it offers that as a part of what it does, it means blockchain doesn't mean that encryption isn't a piece uh, with uh, current traditional databases. Uh, so I, I think I, I'm giving you this. I know this is going to be recorded, so you can go back and freeze this. But it really, I tried to take some of the literature that's available and put it on here a little bit as a debate style. So what is the real, what is the need, um, and what's going on with with blockchain? And I think there's two sides to this. There's um, uh, Navigate has, if you read more recently, has really taken a more uh, aggressive approach towards blockchain. But um, you can see this quote on the middle right, no one is really complaining about the timing or cost of, of, of wholesale power transactions and trading. So it doesn't necessarily mean that people are asking for it. And I think that looking at public versus private, so that's something that um, Alex brought up. I know the opacity of the market is a huge concern for some people. And some people like the fact that the market is opaque. It gives some users more power over others. And so that's a, that's a balancing act that I think the, the REC community and the REC tracking systems are going to really need to balance versus having a public chain versus a private chain. Are you going to, as a, as, a, um, as a utility regulator or as a utility want, expose the regulated um, holdings, which could affect the price they're able to sell or buy for? And as a utility, would you want that? And those are things, as a tracking system, we don't take a position on, but I think it's a discussion that really needs to happen in our community and among um, uh, everyone that's involved in this. And I think there's there's a lot of hype around blockchain, as we saw, but um, and the idea of smart contracts. But um, I think there's some interesting stats that 93% of the Bitcoin mined by managed consortiums, um, uh, 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 and none of them use smart contracts to pay out for the mining. Um, smart contracts, as Alex rightly pointed out, are not necessarily new. Um, I know a lot. Of systems have forward transfers that is a form of a smart contract it says when um, these recs are deposited in this account they're automatically transferred to another one it's computer code that executes an agreement so um, I think what's really key here is that when you're going to blockchain you're shifting your trust from humans to software and auditing is someone that just built a, a complex uh, rec tracking soft software system auditing software is really hard and moving from trusting humans to software, some people think it's a good thing, some people think it's a bad thing, but I just want to bring that up as a philosophical point to think about. And then just because something's on the blockchain or on the on a DLT, distributed letter technology, um, uh, so blockchain or DLT might make it easier to audit um, when data is tampered with, but it doesn't necessarily um, ensure the validity of the data that's written onto the chain. So people just assume that oh if you if you have an inverter that writes to the to the chain so um, if you're not auditing that data which is what the system administrator is doing ensuring that it's correct you're not really increasing the validity of the data on your system you're just having it enter your system through a different technology and and that could be okay but I think it's important to point that out um, so I, I think one of the big pieces uh, that we hear about is the benefits of decentralization. So I think this is something that's key. It was a little bit, I, I think, um, uh, important to the GDPR, what happened in Europe, which is uh, the rise of decentralization and the ability to control more, more of your own data as an asset is something that's important. But that can be done also through comprehensive APIs that allow you to access your data um, in a way that you want. And so that doesn't necessarily, again, require a distributed ledger to do. I think this is, um, uh, uh, so I don't know if any of you are familiar with um, the, the underwear gnomes. It was a, it's a famous South Park episode that's a great social commentary. But I think in this instance, it's, it's really applicable. And um, you ha blockchain might be a very expensive, inefficient way to go from phase one to phase three. So again, it's supposed to make you laugh, but also really think about it. There is a jump to blockchain as a way to go from phase one to phase that I've seen and looked at, and I know Alex can talk as well, but you see new projects on a daily basis. And then um, I, I, I want to bring in, you know, Alex had the same type of, of slide, which is what problems are we trying to solve? Are, are we trying to do smart contracts? Again, that's available on traditional databases. 
what are the issues with trust and data integrity? There haven't been massive breaches, so do, does having a, a distributed ledger technology, is that necessary for the storage of, of these tracking systems? Do we want public um, access? And I know the audience will be able to ask questions that have more thoughts, but I think, um, so what are the problems? Again, uh, I really want to focus, Alex had some information on his slide 12, uh, and, and I think, just to bring it up again, the, the market opacity is a decision that the community, the, the rec tracking community, that everyone that's involved, that's the brokers, the regulators, the utilities, have made a decision to set it up that way. And if we all come together and say that that's a problem, we can solve that, and it doesn't necessarily dictate that we need to use blockchain. Um, the size of units has come up. I've, I've seen this a lot in projects. Well, people don't want things in a megawatt hour. Our system could be set up to track KWH. Um, do people want that? Or do we want to break down these data points into smaller, um, more consumable, and potentially consumable for um, different types of users? Is there, is there a market for that? Do we want that? That's not necessarily, that we have to first answer that question before we decide on technology. And then settlement, that's another issue that's come up. Um, we would love for, uh, we get our data from MISO um, and uh, another um, uh, RTO, but that requires them to be able to get the data faster. So it's not necessarily something that we have, to, so our data is um, S55, so settlement day plus 55 days. If they could give it to us um, and it was accurate the day, the last day of the, the end of the last settlement period, we would take it. It's not an issue of the tracking system, it's, how we, uh, how other systems that we interact with provide this data. And um, I, again, I think a lot of these can be fixed through APIs and through discussions within the community and not just pre-deciding uh, pre on a technology framework. Uh, and so uh, I, I mentioned briefly, and then I want to open it up. I know we're going to open it up for questions, but th this idea of transactive energy, I think is something to really think about. Um, so, and I'll give you my opinion for what it's worth, but um, so according to Green Tech Media, in March 2018, um, there were over 122 uh, blockchain energy startups. Uh, they had raised almost $322 million between Q, um, uh, Q2 2018 and Q1 2018, um, uh, Q2 2017 and Q1 2018, sorry. So they have attracted a lot of money and a lot of investments. Um, 94 out of 122 of those are working on transactive energy. And a lot of that is going to be determined on policy. So I think when you think about it, it would, um, there's a lot of things that would have to come into place before transactive energy is really realized on a big scale, a scale big enough for these companies to move forward. And that, and a lot of that is regulatory. Um, um, and are they separate? Are these transactions separate from RECs? Um, uh, some say they are, some say they're not. So, there's a lot of different discussions, and I think um, that quoted there is, is helpful um, uh, to think about what transactive energy is. Uh, just yesterday, so I'd update my slides this morning. Uh, thank you, Samantha, for uh, helping with that. But the Arizona Corporation Commission opened a docket yesterday on transactive energy, and there's been some press around that. So uh, I haven't had a chance to read it, but they're looking at rules around um, can neighbors sell energy to each other? How does that work? And I think that's where blockchain could be really beneficial. My personal opinion is I don't think people are going to do that. I think getting people to put in prices and, and engage in smart contracts with their neighbors, um, it sounds really cool. And as an energy nerd, it sounds like I want, I want people to be engaged like that. I'm just not convinced that there's a viable market there. Um, but I've been wrong before. So um, uh, I look forward to seeing what happens with that. And I still think it's probably three to five years out at the earliest. And then... My conclusion is I think it's important. I'm just happy people are paying attention to rec tracking systems and what we're doing. Um, you know, people are looking to disrupt us. That's not a bad thing. That makes us think about what we're doing and it brings issues, bubbles up issues that we might not have heard about. So I'm excited to engage with Alex. Uh, I'm excited to engage with you and we want to make this industry, uh, we want to move this industry forward and we look forward to your help and suggestions. Hey, thanks very much, Ben. Let me jump right into questions. Um, Alex, could you go back and explain to people what's the difference between blockchain and LDT? You said people using LDT more, but how is it different than blockchain? Oh, so uh, I would say, uh, just to, to clarify, distributed ledger technology, uh, DLT, 
um, is is the is what we want is what we're describing as the collective um, just dis- uh, description for um, uh, the tech the various technologies of which blockchain is a, is is one technology is a subset of that so that's just basically rolling it up into uh, into uh, into a higher sort of more descriptive because there's also competing technologies against the, the blockchain uh, technology there's uh, this hash graph, I think, is one of the more uh, or, or graph hashes. Uh, it's just another way of of, of basically creating that uh, and achieving that same concept of, of a distributed ledger, um, but through a different technology application. Okay, and here's another question for you, Alex, um, that gets at your point that um, we could apply this technology in ways that aren't as energy intensive as Bitcoin has been. This person says, most security for blockchain concepts comes from proof of work, which requires a huge amount of power to brute force. What about proof of consensus makes you think that this REC blockchain product is invulnerable to a brute force attack? Um. I mean, I can't speak to the specifics of, of how you would achieve a brute force attack. What I what I'd like to to explain is that we are consensus mechanism agnostic. So um, whether it's proof of work, proof of stake, proof of authority, federated consensus, um, we're we're exploring basically all of the above. Or what we're doing is is we're exploring one con- one version of it. And looking at the issues related to it and security around that, um, we, we we're starting with a fully permissioned uh, uh, blo- uh, blockchain application or DLT application, um, and that means that basically, uh, you know, the the normal security uh, um, uh, components, uh, you know, are, are there. So, and then you add to it the layer of the immutable ledger, so that if something does change, you can you can see that change, um, and then you know you have to make a decision as to you know whether you fork or 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 whatever. But but in that sense, that that that's the approach that we're taking. But we're open to whatever is the most efficient. So moving away from you know proof of work to something more towards you know proof of authority or federated consensus. But we're agnostic to it, to it because we think that the technology is it's not mature yet. And the, one of the key things of that of the technology is the consensus mechanism. So we remain consensus mechanism agnostic. Okay, and let me ask you one other question, which follows on that, and then I'll have some questions for Ben. And this person writes in: Don't you think if you take the Bitcoin, i.e., the miners, out of the blockchain, it just becomes a distributed database? My understanding is that there is no mining incentive. It can't be decentralized. So if we have things like trusted miners who have to sign the blocks, then does that mean it's just a fancy centralized distributed system? I think it's a great question. And the question really is built around who, like, who is actually approving the transactions on the node, if you don't have a mining process involved, um, then uh, then you'll have some sort of approval structure. And under, say, uh, proof of authority, you'll have a number of different uh, organisations that are incentivized in some way to approve it. Um, but I, I, again, you the the question over whether if you take mining out altogether, uh, that that this is still uh, a blockchain is a question about what are you trying to solve and achieve uh, with this, and is the tech is a fully uh, you know decentralized application actually the best approach for for this for this this market? And again, that's that's part of the exploration process, and there's not just us, but you know our competitors are taking different approaches, and they and they and they have you know the incented. Uh, uh, you know, mining process usually built on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, you know, where there is some form of gas, you know, or incentive for for people to, you know, to 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 actually agree on the on the block. Um, and you know, we're welcome to to all of those components. And and this, you know, this is a proof of concept, and it's an exploration phase where 
we're learning about, okay, what's the, the most efficient way to, to do this for a market as a whole. Again, I like to, to really ensure that it's understanding the nature of data for the whole market and not just the different silos that exist. Good. So I have a few questions for Ben here. Before I get into sort of more things that link specifically to the content of this presentation, someone wants to know whether MRES is more designed for the compliance market or the um, voluntary market. Uh, I, I would say both. So uh, obviously the compliance market is very important. It's what we were developed for, but you can have, uh, you can have specific uh, um, pieces of your application that are more useful for the voluntary market and other pieces that are more uh, um, directed towards the compliance market without confusing either. So we are able to track um, recs that can't be used for a compliance uh, a retirement uh, still within our system. So you're, you're able to do, I don't think you have to make a choice. Okay. Um, uh, Warren, I'd like, I'd like to just add to, for, for that, to, for, for, with Ben, you know, ultimately they're just a, a different asset type on the same platform, whether it's a, a database or whether it's on a distributed ledger technology platform, Ultimately, we're going to end up just having a stand, some sort of standardization, and and all that they are is a different flavor of the of a, of a commodity. So, where we might have a class one rec, you know, a New Jersey class one rec, or you know, uh, uh, whatever other rec uh, that that you know might be by, be be managed from a compliance perspective, all this is is sim the same as what there is now. It's just a voluntary rec. It's a green e rec on the platform, but ultimately. It's, it's the same basic commodity, you know, one kilowatt hour or one megawatt hour on the platform. Yeah, and, and I think to follow up with Alex, if you build the, the, the system right and build it with the understanding that both are important, you shouldn't have an issue. And we believe we yeah. achieve that. Yeah. And Ben, you had mentioned that you didn't think we need to be using um, blockchain technology to have smart contracts. Um, is MRETS going to be exploring smart contracts? Yes, so um, it's actually in our development queue, I think in the next month to have uh, to put into forward transfers. So they weren't part of our initial release as common when you're launching modern software, you go through its stages. Um, but we do think that there's a role for that. And I think kind of really to hit on what Alex said, I don't necessarily believe that blockchain makes sense in the registry part of what what we do, but I think in terms of having a spot market that operates with um, and not requiring, as Alex said, I've I've spent enough time in meetings with um, brokers and, and people on both sides of these transactions to know that there's frustrations there. I think um, blockchain could uh, really help in the transactive side of what we do. But again, you can have a blockchain system that clears a trade and affects, affects the trade in our system. And through an API, once the recs are transferred, it can signal the payment in some other platform. So you don't need to have the basis of what we do as a registry be built on a distributed ledger technology. And I think that's really key. I, and I do think that at some point when we rebuild our system in a few years, as you're gonna wanna do with maintaining a modern platform, um, that it, it may have some uh, features of what we now call DLT, distributed ledger technology, or it may interact with a, a DLT system. Okay, well, I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll go over a couple minutes because I'll give each of you an opportunity to either summarize or say something you wish you had had a chance to say and haven't said yet. And so this last question is for Ben. You mentioned a lot of concerns related to blockchain. Are these in response to your experience with just Ethereum? Did you explore other blockchain technologies because there are companies that work solely on private blockchain systems rather than trying to take a fundamentally public blockchain such as Ethereum and convert it to private uses? 
Yeah, so I, I think, um, that, thank you for the question. And we did look at um, both, I mean, understanding when we were evaluating building a new system, that was long enough ago that people weren't really thinking about um, Bitcoin and blockchain that much. So um, the, the information that was available around it, I think obviously that's changed. But I think the fact that you're seeing so much rapid change and the technology, as even Alex mentioned, changing um, even month to month, um, investing in building a system right now, um, from our point of view, was too risky to do it on blockchain. It was unproven and it's still not settled on, on what would work. And, and so that was really the consideration that we went with when we were um, building it. I still don't think if we were thinking about rebuild or building something new now, I still don't think we would do it on blockchain because I'm not convinced that um, it would be a benefit to our users. Um, and I, I can't see the benefits that the current tech, the technology in its current form could bring. Um, that a traditional database can't do cheaper, faster, and um, with a better understanding of how it will operate and how it will need to be taken care of over its lifespan. And that's really well, important. Let, let me follow up on that with a, another question for Alex. I said I wasn't going to have any more questions, but I do think this is an important one to get on the table because you're talking to an audience of people here who care about renewable energy. They tend to care about using energy efficient, efficiently, that if blockchain technology is adapted, is that going to inevitably require significantly greater energy consumption than the current approaches? I mean, that's a great question. And that's, again, that's one of the things that we're, we're looking to solve for is, is how do we, um, it, you know, how, how do we understand the total data environment behind what we do. So, you know, renewable energy companies or energy companies, they maintain all of these databases, all of these things that do these very different separate functions. So the back office function and the mid and back office functions, you know, currently those, those are costs that you don't really see on a per unit basis down to the commodity that you're transacting in RECs or whatever. A lot of it is overhead and a lot of it's not understood as to its real cost impact. And I think what, what this exercise does is really force us to look at the, the total data environment, um, you know, how, uh, how a commodity moves through a chain and through the different systems. What are the, what are that, what's that cost? And whether this, you know, can solve, you know, the, the issues that we talk about and do it on a more cost effective basis. Now, some of the analysis that I've done from our own company, particularly being able, uh, uh, NRG being unique in, in, in having its renewable energy asset generation all the way through to the retirement for compliance or voluntary purposes and understanding that full chain and how it's managed and looking at the total cost of that. So from a transaction basis, we're talking about a minimum of, of 3% like transaction cost, but typically, you know, five to, and, and up to 10%, depending on, um, you know, on what, uh, on what market it is and, and who's getting paid, whether it's not just middlemen, it's all of the systems that are used to manage it. Now, if you, if you look at, uh, say, an ETF at, at the way it, it trades today and you told someone, oh, yeah, come join our ETF, um, we'll charge you a transaction fee of three to 5%, or oh, it might be up to 10% that you have to pay to transact, um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't join that ETF. You wouldn't, you wouldn't transact on that platform. And so what we're really focused on in, in these early days is looking at how can we improve that, that, that cost efficiency of the system? What can we do to reduce that cost? And also what can we do to compress the time frame that someone who's doing, you know, who's transacting gets paid? Um, and we believe that this technology, it offers that opportunity. Where it sits, whether it's at the tracking system because of the functionality that it can bring benefits there, or whether it's outside of it, you know, that's something that, you know, Ben and I are discussing, you know, um, you know in quite, quite a bit of detail. And it's something that we're exploring through the, through the project. But, but actually what we see is the, the mid and back office is really the first stage that we're going to see uh, real benefits from the blockchain come, um, and then and and that's from the clearing and settlement and cash flow 
audit and all and 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 you know uh, and all of these accounting and other uh, functions. Great. So um, Ben, do you have any last famous last words for the group here? Yeah. So I, I think um, the one thing that I would um, suggest pushing on for the people that are specifically in the rec tracking world is the ability to access your data. APIs um, are important. And um, I know some systems already have them, and that's great. And the ability to use that um, uh, will help hopefully make your processes more efficient. And, and I do think what Alex brought up that is, is true, and I've heard this, that there are a significant costs. I think I've heard the rec, US rec market is worth about a billion dollars in terms of the credits and then all the activity around it. And um, you know, if 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 ten percent of that is you know what Alex says is wasted, I would say that's a problem. How we address that, I think we really have to drill down and look at. And I'm not convinced that blockchain is the right solution. In a lot of these projects, I just hear conclusory statements. Not not Alex's, um, of, of course, but in a lot of them that we will do all of this for you at a cheaper cost and better. And I think you really, if you're a regulator or utility, really ask those questions and ask what we're trying to solve and. and and I think the, the tracking systems are really great resources um, and, and talk to them and, and give them that feedback that there are issues or that you'd like to see something change because they, they should be responsive and they usually are. Great. And thank you. And Alex, anything you want to leave with the audience? Yeah, uh, I, I first just want to say thanks for arranging me. I think this is great. I'm glad, uh, you know, Ben and I are continuing on our, our dialogue. And, you know, and, and that's what I that's what I would say that everyone needs to, to really kind of get down and, and, and focus on is, is a dialogue between all the, it, uh, between all the key stakeholders. Um, who, you know, what are the functions that everyone performs? You know, what, how do we work together? How do we improve things so that, you know the system as a whole can improve because, again, it it it's not only is it is the market fragmented, but it's also siloed. Different functions are done in different parts of the uh, of of the market, and so if we can get together and really discuss each of those components and see how we can bring them together so that we can can you know be focused on on reducing cost and improving efficiency, then I think that's the that's the key next step. And and, and what we're doing is is webinars like this, speaking at events. So to start to educate everybody and, and bring them together to be able to get on the same page and, and explore whether this is the right technology or not. Again, you know, I'm an advocate for it. I think that there's potential, but we still have to prove that potential. Hey, well, thank you very much, Alex, and thank you, Ben. This has been a really interesting webinar. Thanks for all the folks who joined us on us, and we will be telling you about future webinars for the RPS Collaborative and hope you will join us for some of those. Enjoy the rest of your day.